Good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time zone you're in, everybody. Happy to have you back here with us for the ongoing California Library Association Ursula Meyer Advocacy Fund Training Series. Try saying that three times with your tongue tied behind your mouth. We've got a slide up that introduces this, uh, primarily for the people that are watching the archive version. So you're going to have a blessed 30 seconds or so of silence so you can absorb this. And that'll probably be the only 30 seconds you have of silence between now and the time that we end this, this session about 90 minutes from now. Let me back off so you can read that and then we'll come back in and jump into the whole um, experience that we've got for you. Orange, here we go. <laughs> Training. Need some good time for people to get their cup of coffee. So as you can see from this, it is an ongoing series. We're in year four of it now, and we do have the archives that are mentioned toward the bottom of that on YouTube. We have over 24 sessions dealing with everything from advocacy basics up to the special kind of programming we're doing for much of the year this year, focusing on various community groups and how, while serving as advocates for them, we better our communities, we better ourselves, and we get those kind of ties that make libraries what they've always been, a central part of a community, strengthening and meeting un strengthening the community and meeting unmet needs of its members. That's where we're at on that. Obviously, you see at the bottom of that slide, the pitch for donations. This is funded, as you see from the slide, through a bequest that was made in honor of Ursula Meyer. But we want to make sure this the series stays healthy and well-funded. So if you are moved by this and you want to show support, we don't care how small or how large, obviously large is great, but we don't care what the amount is. If you can make donations to add to the coffers to keep the series going, that's a good sign to people that care about this stuff that we care and we wanna keep it going. So we would encourage you to do that. But that's pretty much the pitch we're gonna do. I'm gonna stop the slides and now we're gonna move into our wonderful colleagues at Monrovia who, because of a friend of mine who was having dinner with about six months ago, uh, my friend made me aware of the wonderful thing that they're doing with their Veterans Center. As we were kicking ideas around, I thought, you got a center there, but really the center itself is a focus of advocacy by what it does. So with that in mind, we're going to start off with Mabel, who runs the center. And I've asked Mabel to start oh. kick off the session by telling us something, a personal story that talks about the impact that the center has on the people who use it and on the community. So Mabel, you're on. Thank you. Um, the Monrovia Public Library Resource, Veterans Resource Center started in 2016. I came on board after one of my supervisors invited me to join her for Veterans Connect at the library. And one of our very, very, very first um, person we assisted was not even a veteran. He, she was a mother of a veteran. She approached us and said, I need your help. Can you help me connect with my son who passed away? The mother, uh, the son grew up here in Monrovia, attended Monrovia High School, and moved. And after his service, he moved to Colorado. But the mother still is in, in the San Gabriel Valley where Monrovia is located. And, and San Gabriel Valley is about 30 miles east of Los Angeles. And, and she came to us and said, please help me connect with my son. Now, Monrovia has benches that the community can, can purchase or to commemorate anybody they wish. However, the mother said she didn't have any money, in, but she wants to connect with her son. So I reached out to the American Legion and one of my connection there helped us connect with the school, with the high school. The school was able to um, assist us in, in, a, in a memorial for the son at, at the Rose Garden in, at Monrovia High School. So there is a plaque for this veteran where his mother and any mem family member would visit at any time. And we have a plaque there for him. That was my initiation to assisting veteran. And that has helped me understand how we need to serve veterans in every way, not, not only to connect them with their benefits, but also the, all, all the other interests, interests that touches their lives, just like the mother did. And now she has a place, a local place where she can she can now connect with her son. There's a heck of a good starting point for what we're talking about. The obvious lesson here for all of us is we often 
times tend to segment our approach to librarianship and to the work we do in our communities. But if we integrate that into the theme that we've run with the Ursula Meyer series consistently here, it's when we do things just by the very nature of our work, we are advocates. And I, I love that, Mabel, you started off so effectively. Let's broaden it out a little bit. And let's go to Kurt, who also is there, obviously, at Monrovia Library. Monrovia, uh, Monrovia. Kurt, you are not your library. You are yourself. Uh, can you start us off with something that's a story that focuses on the difference between what the resource, the Veterans Resource Center is doing uh, for people and the life they had before that that service was offered to them? Sure. Um, I actually just started this past August. So I'm, I'm very much a new member to an already established uh, what I would call a successful veterans resource program. But in the short time I'm here, the biggest thing I've realized is um, the differences. Well, I don't want to say the, the, any difference. I, I've just noticed the community support from Monrovia for its veterans resource program. And it's really blown me away because that that community support is what gives our program the opportunity to um, successfully assist veterans in whatever manner it, it may need. Because um, there's, like Mabel just mentioned, there's so many different ways that veterans need assistance other than just connecting to the benefits. And that's something I didn't necessarily understand before I got here. I've, I've been involved in other um, helping community groups of, of different needs, but that was one thing that I, I really learned here in the short time I've been here. So um, I'll just leave it at that because I think um, Mabel and definitely Carrie are going to have some much better stories to provide for you. Let me go one step further with you, though. I, you've been there for long enough to have seen the people come and go through that center. Yeah. Well, what's one thing that really has surprised you in terms of concrete community support that you didn't expect when you start talking to people about the center? Hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't expect um, just the amount of, of the different people within the community who are asking about it and curious about it. They come, like whether it's, you know, um, a council member, um, people from other city departments, uh, just uh, library patrons in general. It seems from all, all over in different areas. That's, that's what really surprised me. And that's a perfect lead-in for Carrie, our library director there in Monrovia. Carrie, you work at that level of being around the elected officials and members of the community. What's most surprising to you in terms of the reaction that you've seen and the difference that the center's made? Um, I definitely can see, I've worked for other cities um, over the past 20 years or so, and I definitely can see how supportive in all as one we are here in Monrovia like like Kurt mentioned you know we have um a very supportive council we have one of our council members on right now Larry Spicer um but we also have our department head um the city manager we have local businesses that reach out and like what do you need how can we support you like the local Starbucks hosts our monthly veterans meetup and provides free coffee and treats. Like we have local community members who are dance instructors and they just did a veterans line dancing program. So we have like all these amazing support systems throughout the community that everyone comes together, our friends, our foundation, our library board, they all come together as one to help veterans and they see the importance and the need for it. And it's just, it's beautiful to see that. It's beautiful to see so many people, different people saying, what do you need? This is important. What, how can we help? It's lovely. For those who may be new to trying to advocate at this level, what tips would you give them that are concrete in terms of getting that first conversation going with Starbucks or those community groups you're talking about? It's just, you know, asking for help. It's okay to ask for help, you know, especially when you're in a community that's supportive like that. If they can't help, they may know someone who can. So just ask. There's nothing lost by just asking. Are you doing that by phone, by community meetings, or how do you initiate those conversations up front? It just depends on when you meet them and where in the community. So you may meet them at an event and you may just start a conversation or you may just show up and cold call, like either show up at the business or just call them and say, hey, this is something that we're doing. Would you be interested in supporting it? So that's, that's what I was fishing for there. So often when I talk to librarians, even within the same system, you'll see some areas that are well used and some that are just like ghost towns. And when you prod, prod just a little bit, you find that the places that are not the ghost towns that actually have high amounts of use 
are with the librarians and other members of staff who go out into the community and talk and listen and bring help people understand that it's not just everything happening in our building, but it's a seamless connection between what's happening in the building and outside the walls. You've been doing this a while. What are tips you can give people and and getting comfortable with that process? Um, well, I will say for me, it was not easy, but I've worked in libraries for almost 25 years. So I'm used to now just going and be like, hey, I'm from the library. Can you help us with this or that? Um, but we're also, I want to do a special shout out for Mabel, who is absolutely fearless and will call local Congress offices and things like that saying, hey, we really need help with this or that. And she's absolutely amazing, has been a fantastic resource for this program. So. Mabel, we have in previous uh, sessions here in the Ursula Meyer series talked about the legislative process and reaching out to legislators. Let's make this personal. How do you approach that moment when you need to reach out either to a new legislator or to somebody that you have a relationship with and you want to get their attention on something that will benefit the community through your center? I think I'll piggyback on what Carrie said. All I have to do is ask. Um, I, we This program started as a Veterans Connect at the library, which is a which was, was um, administered by the state. And we were guided by that program. It was funded by the state. And then we were guided by that program to link with so many, the, the resources, federal, state, local resources, and the names of those, the individuals who we can connect with. We even had a, a module. Uh, before we even started, we had training. We need to understand the jargons. The, the, the everyday language of a veteran. You don't walk to just talk to anybody and say, hey, you know, you ask them, are you, are you a veteran? Did you serve? And, and with, those, with that, they give us a list of individuals in our community that we can connect with that will guide us. And as you start talking to those individuals, you start to find out the resources, the service, the information, and how you connect with them. And how you connect with them is attending webinars. You attend, well, before COVID, you attend workshops, you would attend seminars, you would, at, you would attend any, you are strongly encouraged to attend those, in the, those events in order for you to be comfortable, not only to understand the needs of a veteran, but who you can connect them with. And once we were, I got comfortable with those individuals, I can pick up the, pick up the phone and say, hey, um, Mr. So-and-so, um, this is what I do. What can you do for me? And sometimes I'm just sitting here and one of them will just show up and say, here, here's the California resource guide. Do you want a box? And, and your so answer I, at that moment I, is? To do that. And even we now have a veterans, local veterans resource, I mean, service officer in the library because I asked. I was I was calling around to assist veterans because I was noticing their frustration by not connecting with the services they 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 are eligible for, which is I think they're also a problem that causes them to be homeless or not even give up. And and I got frustrated too because I felt their frustration. So I picked up the phone and I said, Who do I speak with? And they said, Oh, the director of the Veterans Affairs downtown in Bob Hope. Patriotic Hall. So I picked up the phone and called his her secretary. And within 24 hours, I had somebody come in at, at the library saying, you called? Here we are. There is so much that you just said that deserves unpacking at a substantial level. One thing that strikes me is something you said toward the very end there. You yourself felt that frustration of the people you were trying to serve. Yes. And for those of you that may be new to this and are saying, where do I even start? People just pointed it out. It starts with the empathy. My best friends in advocacy tell me, we don't start out as advocates saying we're going to change the world, although some people do have that grandiose idea. It's generally, you feel something and you get upset and you want to make a difference. You do what Mabel did. You say, I feel that frustration. I'm listening. So I pick up the phone and I call people. Another thing she said leads us back to the last episode we did about a week ago, the Ursula Meyer series. For those of you who didn't see it, it's on the YouTube channel for the California Library Association. It's called Day in the District 2024. And we're noting that as we record this in the middle of March 2024, we're very much in that annual 
a period when CLA and many other organizations will do a day in the district event where they are actually contacting their legislators. It's gotten kind of fun in the sense that it's not just one day. It officially starts in early March and goes throughout the month. And the whole point of this is for you to have a chance to set up meetings with your local representatives, your legislators, and sit and talk and listen. It starts with these saying, what is important to you? And as you hear that say, well, that's important to us too. Can we work on this? I find contrary to what a lot of people will say, we don't just walk out and say, here's what we need. Can you help us? It starts with saying, what's important to you? And finding that common ground like Mabel has done and Kurt's alluded to and Carrie has alluded to, finding the common ground saying, well, we're interested in that too. What can we do together? That comes back to much of what Mabel said. So if this appeals to you and you're watching this live or watching the recorded version here in California at this point in the year, understand this is a moment to make a difference. Your legislators, especially at the state level, are in that point of the legislative year where the bills are being put together. They're going into committees and what's going to pass or not pass this year, the groundwork for that is being laid right now. Your voice needs to be heard at the level of Kurt, Carrie and Mabel are all talking about. Karen and Kurt, anything you want to say in response to what Mabel said or to add on to that? Yes, I just wanted to pick, uh, piggyback off of what Mabel was saying. Just to give a, a quick summary for everyone who doesn't know like Monrovia Library's full story, it initially started with a grant. Um, and at its basic form that Mabel was just talking about, they, they would guide them. And through the grant, they through how the grant was run, they realized that you know the library was kind of acting as the middleman. So the veterans were kind of being bounced around which is very extremely frustrating for them. And that's what Mabel was talking about, how she felt the empathy for that and she wanted to get rid of that. And um, af after the grant ended, they, they, the support from the community, the city, um, library board, Carrie, uh, let me know if I'm forgetting any other organizations that assisted with support. But through that, they were able to continue it. And then as Mabel mentioned, bring in a, um, a veteran service officer on site. So they're not sending anyone away after they come to the library. The library is that one stop. Um, that, that was a realization there um, that the library shouldn't, shouldn't have tried to be the expert. They brought the expert to the library, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Carrie, anything you want to add? And then uh, uh, also as well, um, after COVID, uh, VPAN, the Veterans Peer Access, Access Network, uh, became an organization, and then Mabel also got a representative from them to to have um, a full day here at the library as well, which is, they offer something a little bit different than the veteran service officer provides, but it's still something that is necessary um, for veterans who are looking for assistance. So, Carrie? Um, yes, so we're not only lucky enough to have basically on-site help Tuesday through Friday for our veterans here, thanks to the LA County, our v uh, veteran service officer and VPAN rep, but we also, um, Mabel and Kurt both have built really meaningful relationships with the local VFW. So they're able to go there to their monthly meetings and present on the Veterans Resource Center. Um, through our council members, um, we've been able to connect with uh, other local organizations within the community to be able to promote our Veterans Resource Center. So it helps to kind of get the word out to the community like, hey, you know what, this is available for you. If you know a veteran, if you are a veteran, you know, please come to the library. So even um, when new city employees start, they get an orientation and a tour of the entire city, they come to the library. And one of the first things we tell them is about our Veterans Resource Center so that they can also be advocates so that you're, it's not just falling upon, you know, three people at the library to share this amazing resource. It's everyone within the community is being able to talk about it and share with people they may know. So that um, it's been absolutely amazing. I really feel like that ties into your overall theme of advocacy because it's not just one person being an advocate, it's all of us together working as a team being an advocate, so. Thank you. Let's try in one more voice before I actually open this up and get some more audience participation. Larry, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot a little bit, can you talk about from where you sit, with the many hats you wear, what advocacy has meant on behalf of the veterans through the library there in Monrovia? Well, being a veteran, um, in Monrovia and on the city council, I'm very supportive of our library. Um, it's very important that you ask because the resources are there. You just have to ask for them. And as a council member in Monrovia, 
I'm going to do all I can to support the veterans. And having the resource center here at our library, it saves the veterans the trouble of driving down to downtown LA, to West LA. I've been there. I've gone through all the troubles, but having a resource center here in our local community, it's a blessing. I love what you just said about the difficulty of having to travel a long way to get the information that you can find there in your own backyard. What difference has that made for the people you see in your community, just having that there? A lot of times you can travel over to West LA or downtown and the information's not there. So you've driven down there and come back home without what you needed. Here, you can go to the library, you can talk, you can figure out everything. And if the information is not there, I mean, you're at home. You can always go back because they'll have the information for you when you return. And what's also good is they're connected with our, our local VFW, our local American Legion. You know, everything is right here just like it's in every city, but you just have to take the initiative to act and get the ball rolling. That's all. Are all of you finding that now there are people in West LA or Central LA coming to your library rather than going to their own because they know that you've got that that fine set of services? Yes. Yes. What are you hearing from them, any of you? I'm going to repeat what council member Spicer just said. As a matter of fact, he has used our centers too and family member. I know his father-in-law has also stopped by. So what he's saying is also uh, a testament of what we do here. I I I get messed yesterday, as a matter of fact, I got a call, I received a call from, hey, some so and so told me that you are the person to call. So and we don't ask them where they're coming from, and we don't ask, we don't take their personal information because we are not the expert. Uh, we just guide them to the resources, just like Kurt has mentioned. We guide them to the resources. We do not discriminate. And they have called, I've had people from other states call me as well. And even from no Northern California call me. So I hear that all the time that, oh, somebody, so this person told me you are the one to call. And what is important here is word of mouth as well. The word of mouth goes a long way. And I received so many calls from individuals from different for locations saying, you are the person to call. You will give me the answer I need. And you can also sense the frustration because they already start talking to me. Tell it, ask as if I will give them the answer. You can tell that they were just frustrated. And that's the part I think our resource center is really helping the veterans connect to their benefits. Yeah, whether you're here in Monrovia or Timbuktu, the people are going to connect with our center. Yes, then they do. I oh, love can that. I, ask, I can love I that, that I've heard in so many places that I've enjoyed being in where you ask people, well, why would you, why'd you come to this particular meeting or why'd you come to this service? They go, we heard it's the place to be. Exactly. Somebody else started to say something? Oh, I... Uh... Can I ask a question? I was Please. wondering. Yes. When you when you um, refer to the service officer, is that somebody from Calvet, or do you have a relationship with Calvet? Are they involved with the resource center? What's been your experience with them? Yes, um, Calvet. Calvet was the it was the resource for training all staff and volunteers. They created mm -hmm. six modules. We we're able to be comfortable. We non-veterans are comfortable with um, interacting with the veterans, asking the questions they need, answering the questions they need, and, and giving them the resources, the information, and the service they need. Calvet has, um, I still, even though we the the grant is uh, has expired, ended, I still have a link who is is connecting veterans in in this region. And uh, he was the one I would just mention. He just stopped by and said, "Hey, I have a box of California resource, um, California resource guidebook. Do you want a box, a whole box?" I mean, he goes, "I was in the area, and I was thinking of you because I have a connection with him because I connected with him through through the workshop that Veterans Connect at the library always provided annually, and and if you can 
hear people stop by and say, hey, I just walked by. We have signs in to guide people to. I have a, a sandwich box that um um poster box what's that? A frame. A frame. A frame that I put in front of the library saying um, veteran service officer on duty. So even if you just walk in, walking past the library or you coming into the library and you had no, because people are surprised to know that there's a veterans, veterans service at the library. They're expecting a government building because even when they call and go, what suite should I go to? You know, you don't come to, you don't go to the suite. You walk into the library, a hub for all kinds of information social, um, um, educational, and veteran service. We welcome you all. Yes, Calvet hear... does play a big part and I still connect with my my link. I keep hearing that theme of connections here. If we were at a sporting rally, I'd do a spell right now, give me a C, give me an O. And and the and the veterans the the veterans service officer is the Los Angeles Military Affairs Veterans Resource um, um, oh, Officer. See. He's not Calvet, but he's he can provide information Calvet, I mean, does for veterans. Thank so the person that asked the initial question, um, am I getting your name right, Hubert? Yeah, that's right. Did it right. Never happened again. Mm -hmm. You've given me an opening here. Instead of just staying on the loose script that we had here, I love the idea that there are probably a lot of questions from the people in here today. So let's just move right in, at least for a few minutes, to Q&A. So far, you've heard about the, the use of empathy, being out there, how to get to your legislators. What question do you have for the people in Monrovia at two levels? How do you make a veteran center work as a center for advocacy? And larger, what lessons carry over from that in the larger center of advocacy or larger issue playing the ground of advocacy on, on behalf of special interest groups. So anybody, questions for them? I have a question. Please. Uh, hi, I'm. Uh, my name is John Encarnacion. I'm the adult services librarian, one of the adult services librarian at uh, Ontario City Library, and I'm the one tasked with the Veterans Resource Center here. Um, like Kurt, I actually started back in August uh, for the VRC here, so I'm pretty new to this uh, world of veterans and library services. Um, so my question is, so our center here is, at least since 2016, has mostly functioned as referral service, as you guys have described your center. Um, but being new to the position, I actually wanted to expand the, the our center to have more, uh, more um, programs and services for veterans that aren't just the referral service that we you know, that we basically do, um, you know, I want to do um, like sort of recreational or educational things like that uh, programs. And I was just wondering, like, what kind of um, things has Monrovia Library have done that's outside of the typical referral service? So just since I've been here, we, we've had several different kind of events, like one one night we had a veterans paint and sip night. So we have like uh we have a an artist teacher come in and show people like you know how to how to paint. Um, I don't know if you've heard of like purple easel, like one of those type of things where they they teach the whole class the same thing, and then you have like wine to sip on, and that just gets people in like a social setting, and in the conversations is where the benefits really happen because like Mabel said, word of mouth is is the strongest force. So stuff like that. Um, also, kind of what I realized like we we have the the, the monthly meet up at Starbucks, which is just kind of open, open-ended conversational, very, um, what's the word, uh, non-formal, informal. Um, but talking, getting events to where you can meet your local veterans and talking to them, I've already realized there's no one way or one program that's going to uh, reach all of them are going to be beneficial to all of them. There's, mm -hmm. there's many different um, ages of veterans, um, veterans from different branches, veterans who have had different experiences, or family members of veterans. So I think just getting, um, you know, a, a very informal, fun type of program, obviously letting them know it's for veterans, and then having, if you can, I know you, you don't have anyone in your actual building, but maybe that would be your initial step is to reach out to anyone from, um, I, I think, Ontario, San Bernardino County, correct? So yes, right. Yeah. So one of if uh, one of uh, San Bernardino County offices, um, if they have the veterans resource officer, just to go to that event to maybe get that initial 
conversation started so we're here yeah we have an expert here and then maybe you can build um strong relationships after that hey john and also you have a good city manager scott ochoa he will support support you in the needs that you need for veterans mm, yeah i'm familiar with scott ochoa yeah he's a great guy <laughs> that's uh, right johnny you can call me time. i'm sorry who you can call me. this is mabel oh hi mabel Hi, I used to work closely with James, your predecessor, and you can call me. That's what we do. We connect with each other because Ontario is, was one of the libraries um, with the Veterans Connect at the library. And I stopped by there when James was, was the leader there and, and picked his brain. So oh, I'm <laughs> rather happy to do the same for That's you. great. Yeah, I've met James once, and so I've heard great stories about him. <laughs> yes, we we all we all come up, we all help each other. I'm um very close. We we used to have thirteen libraries, Veterans Connect Library in Southern California. By the time um the program ended, there were sixty three throughout the state. So and for those, we always meet in workshops and training, so we we're able to share information, which was encouraged by the by the grant as well. So. I'll be more than happy to help you. Um, as you can see here, I was real pleasantly surprised, but not disappointed that the council member Spicer is on this on this um on this panel because this is what Monoga is all about. I mean, I I'm not even surprised. Last year we had a picnic for veterans and providers, and he was one with one of the aprons and doing the barbecue. So <laughs> You, your community have to support you. And I don't, I mean, I cannot even, I'm surprised he's here to tell you the truth. I'm not <laughs> surprised that he's here. So from council members to the man on the street will help you. You need to get to know, also get to know your, your community. And I am so blessed to be in this position because you see my manager is here. My, my supervisor is here. My council member is here and everybody in between. The mayor also helps. So you you just get to know and don't don't hesitate to ask. That's what I found out. Don't hesitate. I'm veterans are a very very unique group of people that everybody just wants to help. I'm, mm. I'm involved, I mean I connect with the all of my congress the, the 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 two congressional people here in in our district um both are women. I connect with them. I connect we connect with the assembly member. You just need to connect with whomever is. That's why Kurt asked you what county you are in. Just, just go for it, and I'll okay. be happy. To <laughs> just give me a call. I'll be more than happy to share with you the people who will help you connect with the, with the resources you need. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem. Let us stop for just a minute here and see what just happened. Here's the joke version, followed by the serious, like trainer facilitator version. The joke version is. Okay, uh, John meet Kurt. Kurt meet John. Oh yeah, and there's Larry. Larry meet John. John meet Larry. Oh, and and then Mabel's jumping in and talking about the things that are going on. Advocacy in action, folks. It's getting the right people in the right room and having the right conversation. If we look at it at a serious level, you have this center that started as a service center, but from the very moment it was set up conceptually, even if it wasn't overtly described this way as a place where you could advocate on behalf of the unmet needs there. And as Mabel said, this is a unique group of patrons, library users, library members that were serving in a community. But this would go for any community. And that's what we're trying to explore this year through the Ursula Meyer series, how you identify those groups. And you have those conversations, you get people together. If we can do this, we are creating the most wonderful learning opportunities and advocacy opportunities and going back to the heart of what libraries do these days, you know, Dave Lanky's work at all. He's got his Lanky's corollaries that he published about a year ago, the five things that build on what Raganathan said about a hundred years ago. And one of them is libraries should be safe places to have dangerous conversations. Another one of them talks about the building of communities. And a third of the corollaries talks about the whole idea that people come into libraries not well, the definition of a library, actually, is what Dave is, is addressing here. If you have a place with a bunch of books, that's not necessarily a library. But if you have a room with a librarian in it, it's a library because it's about the connections and the building of those things. Actually, in Dave's more wonderfully radical moments, he talks about people in the community being part of your collection. And that's what we're seeing in this particular session. 
We don't need a bunch of PowerPoint slides. We do not need a lecture. We need a theme like what is important to us? What are we seeing that works? Like what's working at Monrovia and how can we replicate that? And then we'll get people out of the goodness of their hearts who will jump in like Larry's jumping in and Hubert's jumping in and John's coming in and the rest of you who haven't spoken yet. This is the heart of advocacy. Is why I personally am so excited to be involved with CLA on this ongoing project. I'm delighted that people like John, Kurt, Carrie, and Mabel are willing to come in as co-presenters and co-facilitators say, it's not that hard. We just have to have the open heart to do it. Other questions or comments from people that are in the session today? Um, yes, I have a question from Anaheim Public Library. So we don't have a full Veterans Resource Center, but several years ago, we started a program. Uh, we received some Chromebooks as probably, um, you know, maybe some of uh, the other libraries here did as well. And we decided to make them specifically available to veterans, Chromebooks and hotspots for checkout. And we've we've had some level of checkout and we've tried to present um, you know, to, at different uh, veteran events uh, in the community and, you know, make other city departments aware of it. Just wondering if you have any suggestions for trying to increase the awareness of this program and, and the use or, or reach out to people who might be able to use this resource. Um, well, my suggestion would be, um... I think since it, for what you're saying is right now, you just have laptops available for veterans. Right. Chromebook hotspot kits. Correct. Chromebook, okay. Um, well, I think one thing I, I would try if I was in your position is maybe looking for a local veterans themed event, something for veterans, going there, tabling, and then speaking with them in person. Like, look, this is what we offer. Is this something that is interesting to you? If not, what do you suggest we do offer to help you. What are you, what are you looking for that the library can help you with? Because um, I know I've heard this from many, many good mentors. It's not, you don't want the library to necessarily decide how to help the community. You want to listen to what the community actually needs help with and then figure out how you can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my, my experience has been that, uh, because this sort of relates to a question I had, was on uh, demographics because usually, you know, and I don't know who uses the center, but it seems to me that especially older veterans don't want to access through the technology. They want a personal connection with somebody and they want a navigator to work for them and help them, you know, uh, if there's any technological issues involved or access that's needed, any online uh, access that's needed. So, you know, it seems to me it would be important that, you know, that rather than just the laptop, that there be some connections about, about you know, at least li listing sites on it or something, or at least, uh, uh, you know, you, you can have sites on it, but you can't, but, but somebody needs to be, be there to explain what this site can do for you and, or tell you that this is the right one for the problem you have. And that seems to me what they're doing in, in Monrovia with a more personalized attention. Okay, thank you. Um, no, just to, no, no, can no, I just no, really no, quickly no. though, um, and maybe Mabel will mention this, but what Hubert said about the human connection, so many of the people that call Mabel are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm actually talking to a person. Like they're so used to calling and being forwarded on to some automated message, some automated, or go to this website to fill out your form. And so, so much of that is that human connection of just being able to talk to someone, especially if it's a person who's a veteran who maybe is not tech savvy or they've had experience, bad experiences in the past when they had driven out to West LA and then they didn't have the information they needed and then they had to drive home. I mean, some of that is, the trust that you're building up and a human connection that's difficult to build up through technology means. So definitely when we've done feedback with our veterans, it's been so much of, we want socializing events. We want to be able to connect with one each other, which is why we're doing the meetups and the picnics mm -hmm. and the dinners and things like that is because so mm -hmm. much of it is we just want to be able to talk to other veterans and, and make connections and share our stories and things like that. So, so sorry, go ahead, Mabel. I'm so sorry. 
Donald, what what are the, what's on the on the on the laptops? What kind of information do you provide on the laptop? It's not providing specific information so much as providing that technology to patrons to uh, veterans who may be lacking it, who may not have, maybe they don't have a computer at home, maybe they don't have internet service at home. So so that was what we had in mind rather than providing, I mean, at least at this point, specific information, just making that technology available where it might otherwise be lacking. So it's not veteran-centered? No, not at, uh, not at this time. Right. Fiona has just made a lovely addition comment in the chat here we had a laptop giveaway for veterans for a veterans event at our library when they came to pick them up most of them stayed and chatted for an hour to connect with each other right. reminds me of those of us who have had different church experiences of having the coffee and donuts after the service my wife and i have had the most hysterical conversations over dinner over a long period of time where she had one uh, religious group that she was part of and my family came from an entirely different one and she would look at me and say you know, when we have our service afterwards, we actually gather for an hour or two and we have coffee, we have donuts or lots of conversations. She says, what's wrong with you people? You don't do that. And I just would laugh. <laughs> I recognize, well, yeah, we, in our particular church, people would go and they'd sit through the service and then afterwards it'd be a few minutes to slurp down the coffee and donuts and they'd run off and do their thing. But I think she captured something that Fiona's capturing here, that whole opportunity to talk, just as in these series that we do through Ursula Myers, it's not one person or a panel of people lecturing you. It's people sharing information, but the real action is in the conversation, like Kurt meet John, John meet Kurt. That's fun. It's productive. And it shows us the power of advocacy when we realize we are not alone in our efforts. Thank you. That, that's some excellent food for thought. But thanks for the contribution, Donald. Anyone else questions for the panelists or for each other? Because again, we're seeing here what I love about training opportunities. The typical thing is somebody thinks you go in and you, you have all this stuff as I've described, and then you have your exam and you're done. The real thing for me in training is let's talk. Let's see where we're at and let's walk out with ideas from each other that are so exciting. At the end of it, we say, that was the best period. Of, that is the best way I could have spent that time given all the other options available to me. Fiona's actually got her hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, so my question is, how did Monrovia Library actually initially um, discover that this was a, a group in the community that needed more resources? Good question. I'll try to answer that because I came on board in 2016 after the grant was already awarded. And it was um, a grant that was um, my, one of my previous supervisor had applied for. She started off with um, War Comes Home, um, what was also a 2014 grant that she had worked on where there was a traveling group of veterans trying to connect with the community. That's how it started. It just just saying, hey, this is who we are. Then the, most of them had ink tattoo all over their body describing their journey in their, in their service journey. And they were going from one, they're going to museums and libraries and connecting. I mean, everybody knows that the library is a hub of that community. And, and they go to the library, present themselves, have a display of whatever it is, either in person or in an art form. And after that, she finished with that grant and she did apply for the Veterans Connect at the, at the library, which is um, which helped to increase the, the veterans population, the, the intake into both the federal and state um, um, registration so that California, Texas and Florida are the three largest um, states with the large veterans population. So when they when either federal, state, or local allocates their their whatever their person their personnel their, their funds, they're able to say, hey, we have a hundred, we have one point six million veterans in California. So we will give them this much money. We will provide them with this much training, and as opposed to going to Rhode Island, for example. So the two, I mean, it's apples and oranges. It's not apples to apples. So with that, we were able, she applied for that grant and we were awarded, it was a two year federal grant and we were awarded that grant and that's how we got, it got started. 
Let's take this opportunity to go a little further with it. It's, it's pretty clear to everybody listening to this that you started this with grant funding. There came a moment, which always happens with grant funding, where that runs out and people either say, okay, we're moving on to something else or, oh, we're not done with this. We are so not done with this. Exactly. Those of you who were there when that happened, what was that conversation like in terms of we're not done with this and how did you make that transition from grant funding to the way you do it now? Well, you see the representation here. The council member was there because he <laughs> was also involved. Like I said, he came, he used the library, and he used the resources, and he knows what services we were providing. So he was able, to, he's a member of our local VFW. He attends the meeting, and, and you go to any VFW meeting, and they go, oh, yeah, we know Larry. And, you know, he goes to, the, to these events, Kiwanis Club, Rotary Club, we, I, I stop by there at the meeting. I go to their meetings and say, this is who we are. You know anybody who needs, just like Carrie said, you know anybody who's a veteran? And, and it's not only the veterans, their family members show up. I mean, I'm, I'm helping a woman just who, whose husband just passed away a month ago. Right now, I'm guiding her into, she goes, what do I need? I don't know where to start. So we're waiting for her husband's death certificate for her to proceed. So well, I am very, very lucky to have the support that I have. Kirk is here, my supervisor. The library manager is here. Council member is here. I, I, I cannot even ask for more. All I have to do is open my mouth. Or all I have to do is do my job. And, and they see it. If you have your user support, I, I want to go to a meeting. I would like to join a webinar. I would like to go to downtown and they go, go. You have the opportunity to go. So if you have the support from, from whoever it is that you're working with, I'm quite sure you'll be able to do as much as you can with the dedication and the support and the need in the community that you have. Like I said, California, Rhode Island. Now, you see, how do you allocate that? John, I'll get to you in just one minute, but I want to point out a couple of things that Mabel said that I think are essential to advocacy. When she talked about having the right people in the room, and then she said, we know Larry. It's that whole thing that for me is... Has me swing. Pardon? <laughs> No, okay. actually, you know, you're Council showing respect when you say Spicer. Councilman Spicer, but the, the heart of advocacy here is, I know Larry. That's personal. That's yes. the one-on-one -on -one connection that takes us somewhere. And I don't hear Larry objecting at all to being called no, Larry rather wouldn't. than the Councilman, Super, or Councilman Spicer. The essential thing to remember here, and I swim upstream when I say this to my colleagues, let us drop mechanical words like networking, which sounds so calculating. Let us talk about building personal relationships that are meaningful. So we get to the point where we say, I know Larry. And almost on the, the tail of those words, she said, in referring to the, the clients, the people that she's working with, her collaborators in advocacy, they are family members to us. Again, we're not talking about a special interest group that's hiding, hidden behind some name. These are part of our family. This is our community. And again, I can't think of a better example I've seen in all the episodes we've done through the Ursula Meyer series of people talking from the heart about what make advocacy work. It's the personal side. John, you had your hand up. You want to run with it? Sure. I just had a couple comments. Well, one comment and like a couple questions, but I wanted to add, I know I'm not, I don't work at the Monrovia Library, but I'm uh, one of the earlier questions was about what happens when the grant money runs out. So uh, I started working after the grant money ran out here at Ontario, but I know that James Auger, the previous librarian who was in charge of the VRC here, he had um, made a connection with a representative from JVS SoCal um, a gentleman by the name of Marco Diaz. Marco, he was a career coach. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, Marco? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Really. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, James made a connection with Marco Diaz from JVS SoCal, and he volunteered uh, some of his time during the week to uh, sort of staff the VRC desk here, uh, uh, you know, a couple days a week and stuff. And so he was an on-person, um, or excuse me, he was, uh, he was on site and he was able to help our veterans, uh, you know, continue serving our veterans uh, regard, you know, in whatever they needed. And so that's how they were able to manage that over the last few years uh, since the grant money had ran out. Um, but kind of continuing off from that topic, um, I was curious in terms of function, you, uh, you guys said that you have a VSO um, working Thursday through Friday at the Monrovia Library, right? Yeah. 
Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday through Friday. Oh, Wednesday through Friday. Excuse me. So on the rest, on the other, you know, couple days of the week, um, are you volunteer run or is it, uh, you know, Carrie, Kurt, and Mabel uh, staffing the VRC? Um, or how does it work? Because right now it's just me um, and we have another representative from JVS SoCal, but we were thinking of doing a, you know, uh, mostly operating on volunteers um, right now, but we haven't hired any volunteers yet. Um, so just to add, we also have a VPAN rep on Tuesdays who's here all day. So our uh, VRC is basically staffed from Tuesday through Friday with between VPAN and the VSO. Um, and then uh, Mondays and the weekends, it does um, come back down to Mabel, who is amazing and awesome and answering lots of messages that she gets from local veterans and their families. So. And I just want to add too, we recently also had um, the VSO on Mondays, but unfortunately he was sent to another location, a new location in Laverne. So we're, we're sharing our VSO. <laughs> oh, okay. You have ever turned away now to steal him back? <laughs> we're very lucky to have him three days a week. Right. We're the only library apparently that that happens. So we're very, we're very lucky. We consider ourselves very lucky to have it. So. It may seem like stating the obvious here, but when we talk about advocacy and the importance of libraries there, I remember the years that I just adored uh, running the volunteer program for San Francisco Public Library. If you are not looking at volunteer engagement, you are missing some of the lowest hanging, most wonderful fruit out there. In the years that I was working in San Francisco Public, we had people of all levels of experience, all types of backgrounds coming through. We'd have people with their MLIS is coming in to volunteer because they couldn't find work and they just wanted to keep their chops up. We'd have attorneys who would come in and be willing to do legal advice under the auspices of a library program there. We had wonderful volunteers that were very tech savvy that would come in and show people how the computers worked at a time when people were struggling to get used to what we all now just take for granted, the online public access catalogs. Your volunteers can be a tremendous source of immediate help if you can't staff centers like that. The key is adequate, not adequate, but really good training up front to help them understand the culture of your library and your community and understand what they can and cannot do as volunteers so that they know when to answer a question, when to refer it on to somebody on staff, when to engage with somebody and when to step back because it just might not be appropriate for them to have those conversations or it might frankly not be safe if they don't know how to deal with somebody that is a little bit edgy. So the training up there is really essential, but it starts with getting those volunteers in to do that, that you need them to do and then having there as a cadre of people who become your supporters, your advocates, as so many people at the California Library Association who do advocacy on a day-to-day -day basis say, it's great when a librarian goes in and talks to a legislator. It's even more effective when what they call a civilian goes in and talks. It's like the point score goes up so much more. And that's the heart of your volunteers. I'd like to turn it back to the three main panelists right now. You know that I saw the news story that was done on one of your volunteers uh, within the last year or two. Can you describe that for people that aren't familiar with that news summary and talk a little bit about that volunteer's role in your center? The news um, summary? Yeah, with Joe Callahan. Oh, oh it's... <laughs> She smiled like, oh, yeah, I know Joe. That's Joe is his amazing. Family. He's awesome. Joe, Joe is amazing. Is correct. Carrie is correct. Joe, Joe happened. Um, we do also have a literacy center um, in the the veterans, the veterans room and the literacy center just across the way from each other. So Joe was uh, Joe is a, is a veteran himself. He's a Navy veteran and he was tutoring. And when I opened, when I started the, when we started the room and then he walked in and he goes, what are we doing here? What are you doing for that? He started asking so many questions. And before I knew it, he already signed up. He signed up to vet, to, to volunteer and he has been a wealth of information. He knows how to market. He will, I mean, we had ABC and CBS come and interview us because of Joe to just explain um, what the, the services we're providing here. We used to, um, before COVID, we used to, there is a veterans um, history project where veterans can share their story, the wartime story, and it's archived in the Library of Congress. And he, what, what, what we would, when we get an interested party, Joe will visit them and get to know them. And most of the, most of the candidates we had, um, 
uh, older and sometimes they forget their story and he knows how to massage, just like you doing, Paul. He is able to guide them in remembering their story because he would visit them a couple of times to interview them, share in a comfortable situation where they don't have the cameras and they don't have, they know, all the equipments are not around. We, once again, very, very fortunate to have our local um, TV station where we would, we would um, do all the interviews where, because this project had stipulations on what in you, you're supposed to be able to be in a soundproof area, no dogs barking, no water running, no, you know, and so on and so forth. So, but Joe will attend, go to their homes at first, introduce himself, be, become very acquainted with them, take as much notes as he possibly can. So that on that day when we go to interview them, he's going to be able to, when they're nervous, seeing all the lights and the cameras, and he would, they will forget what they're saying. And he goes, well, I, if I remember correctly, you said, and then they would then pick up from there and share their story. And, and Joe also has written three books and all proceeds from those books are towards the veteran program. He, not a single penny goes back to him every month. He goes, did you get the check? <laughs> so he's been very, 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 very supportive of the program. Let's and turn this I, into Alex. I would just like to say, because we do have a lot of very amazing, uh, wonderful volunteers. I don't mean to just say Joe is our own volunteer. Um, we have some really amazing volunteers. We have one that comes every Thursday and sits in our lobby. He's a volunteer, uh, he's a veteran himself, and he interacts and talks with other veterans, letting them know about the service. We have amazing veterans or uh, volunteers within the community who show up at our events and help, like um, Larry uh, Michael, one of our other volunteers. He was right there with Larry helping us serve burgers at our picnic last year. So we have some really amazing volunteers who help support the Veterans Resource Center. And we couldn't do this without them. So, so let's uh, not all the advocacy 101 for just a minute, Mabel and, and Carrie. We were thinking here about the Joes in our facilities and in our advocacy efforts. How do you get the Joes in front of the media? The real question here is how did your local news station discover Joe and do that story? Well, with, with ABC, he reached out to them. <laughs> with with CBS, it was one of another veteran who comes every Mondays and Thursdays now to digitize um, our high school yearbooks. And he is a Navy veteran as well. And he was just watching the news. And some, sometimes in some of these um, news um, channels, they would, they have a segment in their program where there's, if to, they reach out to the community. So if you know a veteran, who would like to share their story. So he reached out to them, told them to reach out to me. And that's how I was able to connect with CBS. And that's the perfect story there. It reminds us all that if we're not big enough to have a media department, a PR department, that sometimes working with volunteers can be a very effective thing. And in that case, the volunteer was savvy enough to reach out and then loop Mabel in quickly so that you had the full story told from the perspective of the volunteer and the library itself. Any other observations there? And Kurt, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I, I was just gonna to to piggyback off of um, John's John from Ontario's question from earlier about like having people staff there. I know it it it, it may be difficult. Sorry, I have a fly flying around. <laughs> uh, Get a volunteer quick. Yeah, another volunteer. I'm gonna see. Well, that that's where I'm going with is like maybe. At first, you may or not able to get a VSO, but you know VPAN is an option because I know our representative Brock from VPAN. He also goes. Um, I'm not sure what his schedule is, but he's at like the local colleges. Like, um, was it? I can't remember which one we, we went to recently. Was it? Um, Glendale. I'm, blank I'm blanking. Where did we go, Mabel? Glendale, was Glendale, Glendale Community College. Gl yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, with, with the assembly member, they had a program speaking, like where the public can ask questions about veteran services. Um, but maybe you go there and you go to their, their veterans, what, I don't know, it's not the ROC or I forget what it's called, but he has an office there and there may be connections there or volunteer opportunities there that you can connect with, um, as, just as a start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's circle back. Cause I think we got about halfway through the, the whole thing of how did you make a transition from grant funded to library funded? Anything that the three of you want to add in terms of that process, specifically guiding other people on how they might do the same thing? Our Friends of the Library supports us too with, with funds. 
And and now the city has stepped in. Where, where is it, Mr. Spicer? Go. The city <laughs> has stepped in, and Carrie can explain that she she does the budget. <laughs> um, I will say, uh, when the grant funding went away. Um, my department director, our city manager, Larry, and the rest of the council were like, all right, we need to keep this going. How much do you need? And like, that is like some sort of miracle sometimes in public libraries to hear that from people. Um, but it was absolutely amazing. They came in, we were able to rebrand everything. We were able to hold all these big events. Um, it really kind of, sometimes when you're in a grant, you're kind of limited on how you can do things because it's a larger structure of a statewide grant. Now we were just kind of like, well, what can we do that will work for our community? And like, how do we structure our veteran services for Monrovia to fit the needs of Monrovia? And so it really kind of opened us up. We were able to do lots of things that we hadn't been able to do under the grant. We had a lot more funding and support. So it was absolutely amazing. And we just worked on the budget for the coming fiscal year for 24-25. We're doing 22 events for veterans in the coming fiscal year, and we're going to be submitting our budget. Hopefully that Larry and everyone else in the council will pass for us, but um, it's always fantastic to have that. It, that transition, um, it was a small miracle here in Monrovia, but it can happen in other places. All you have to do is build those relationships and ask. We need to be hearing more of those stories, specifically the, yeah, Larry said, what can we be doing? Those of you that have come to some of the earlier Ursula Meyer series sessions will remember last fall when we were doing the book challenges things in October, November. By the way, those are both recorded or again on this California Library Association YouTube channel thing, well worth watching. The story that sticks with me was from the second of the two sessions where a local San Francisco Bay Area librarian was talking about how they were under siege for book banning. And it got to an issue, I think, around gay and lesbian issues, um, the books that were being challenged. And so they were talking to their city council a little bit and reporting on that. And the city council said, well, we can't have that going on. What can we do? Can, can you do more programming? And the library said, well, we'd love to, but we don't have the funding. And the council member said, well, let's get that funding in. And that conversation led the council to actively involving at the same level you're hearing Larry interacting with staff there. And it is not too soon. It is never too soon to be having those conversations with your legislators and especially the legislative aides that have their ears. If you were talking on a day-to-day -day basis or a monthly basis or whatever you can get in to do about what you're doing, what they're doing, and see where your overlapping interests are, then when the fire really starts, you have that and the fire gets put out quickly. And what comes out of that is Phoenix-like. Who would have thought this beleaguered librarian was going to end up with city-funded programming that flew in the face of the challenges that were coming? Who would have thought Monrovia would have the thing that happened with Larry, unless you all are way ahead of it, much further down the road than I am, and go, oh, yeah, that's just the way we roll in Monrovia. Rosa's got a comment or a question, actually, here in chat for you. We're working on a veteran's oral histories project and looking to add veterans' resources to the event portions to give information to veterans. Who would we connect with? Um, can I just beautiful? like cl clarify that question? Do you mean like for general advice or do you mean like within your community would be good starting points? Sorry, didn't mean to put you on the spot, Rosa. Sometimes. <laughs> Are you good? I'm good. Thanks, Thank Larry, you, Larry, for being with for us. Coming. Thank you. We're waiting for the clarification from Rosa. Anything that you can take out of that initial question? Oh, I, I was just saying um, we're looking for like a resource to have. Um, we're looking to do um, oral interviews of community uh, members that were that are veterans or were vet, you know that are veterans um, in the community of El Monte and South El Monte. And we thought it would be good to have resources available to them that maybe they don't realize that are available to them. So we're just looking to see how we can connect them to have them at the events, whether it's inviting someone from the VA or from, we're, we're actually gonna look to do the oral um, interviews at the local um, VFW or the American Legion, but we would like to offer some kind of information to them, excuse me. 
<clears throat> I would imagine your 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 VF your local VFW might have a, a veterans resource officer that that is frequents that location, maybe reaching out to them and seeing if you can connect with that officer to, or just you know the LA County um, Military Veterans Affairs Office to see if they're willing to send someone out for that event. Thank you. Rosa, um, what what are you planning on? What do you what do, what does a program look like? Are you going <clears throat> to do store in locally on your like say you the library's YouTube or how do you want to proceed with, once you have the recordings? Um, once we have the recordings, we are hoping to um, have them at the um, La Historia Museum where I volunteer. Oh, at the museum. It's a local um, museum, historical museum archive. Mm -hmm. community archive and um we'd also like to end up doing a exhibition with any photos and maybe if they allow it any clips of their interviews okay. to present to the community so people can see more of what veterans are in our community maybe just start by a flyer telling them you're interested in volunteers and see how many takers you get there's also an event coming up in El Monte on April 5th, 6th, and 7th um, called Heroes in the Shadows. So that's definitely an event where you can definitely um, establish new partnerships, I think, and see and let them know like what, what you're trying to plan out and if anyone's willing to partner, which I'm sure there are. Yeah, that's good news. Like I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, they oh. seem like they have those events, those stand down events, um, maybe quarterly, Mabel. Because it seems like the uh, Elamani is very active. They have a lot of veterans events happening there. That that event is is going to be sponsored by the Congresswoman Grace Napano Tanu's office. Um, if you if you have my information, I can forward that information to you. Okay. And do not please overlook the value of social media outreach. You know, if you've got a Facebook account, if you've got Instagram, TikTok, or anything else that your audience is using reaching out there is, can be essential and a real game changer. And it's not just saying we're looking for interviewees. It's posing a question that is is meant to inspire responses. We all too often think social media is just another way of us to broadcast out our needs, where in fact, the real power of it is engaging with people in a positive way. So if you're looking for people that would be involved in this, you might say, we're looking for people on our oral history project. Here's what we're trying to document. Uh, what do you think we should be looking at? Who should we be interviewing? And invite people to participate at that level. It makes your job so much easier. And it's another essential step in building the coalitions that make advocacy work. So three views from Monrovia. Anything else you want to say about that transition from the grant funding to library funding to make that work? I think Carrie would be the one to tell because I don't need to with the budget. I just go help the people. <laughs> but the but like I said, the friends of the library were very very supportive when we initially started. When we initially um, the grant ended, the funding ended, and and they were more than happy. They're the small but mighty. They were able to support us in programs. We had a hike. Um, Monrovia and Monrovia has um, some is is buttressed against the the San Gabriel Valley, the mountains. Is it the is it the anyway? And there's a there's a waterfall in the, a canyon where we went on a hike, and they sponsored it. We, the veterans and I and and my supervisor then went on the hike. By the end of the hike, we came down and they provided lunch at the foot of the mountain. So it was it was wonderful. It's amazing. They were very, very supportive. We li the library board is very, which is the reason why we're here, because a library board member spoke with you, Paul, and here we are sharing our story. I mean, again, it's we don't want to underestimate the ability of people talking and leading to the, the kind of opportunities we're talking about today. If it wasn't totally clear to you, we wouldn't be having this conversation today and a friend of mine and I hadn't been having dinner together while I was in Southern California on an entirely different business trip last fall. And it was in the course of us catching up with each other that he mentioned the wonderful things one Robby at Public was doing. I said, oh, by the way, I put on the different hats and I'm doing the series. Might they be interested? That's how we continue to do this outreach. It's going 
not to the places where we expect to be wearing our advocates hats, but having those advocates hats as essential parts of everything we do and always watching for the opportunities that lead toward the sort of positive, responsive changes in our communities that we know we're capable of making, but so often are misled into thinking that we can't make just because nobody can change anything or we're all so divided, we don't have any common ground. Look at the conversation we've had this morning. There's plenty of common ground here and it has nothing to do with where you sit on a political spectrum. It has everything to do with listening to others and saying, where's the need and what can we do together? A couple of mechanical questions about the process and then let's do a little workshopping here. For those of you that have been involved in this program uh, at Monrovia for a while, who do you wish you had reached out to early on that you didn't? If anyone. For me, and I'm still struggling uh, reaching out, I want to connect with women veterans and the younger veterans. Um, I see mostly Vietnam in Korea, and I love the Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, Afghanistan veterans and women veterans. And they are a group of people who have a very interesting experience and you can see, especially the younger veterans, you can see the difference in their thought process. Um, uh, we we were, Kurt and I were, were at the VFW um, last month doing one of their, their, their monthly meeting and you, you, the population there is Vietnam in maybe sprinkle with desert storm. After that, there's nobody younger than that. I would love to be able to see how and how different their thought process is in, in what and how we can engage with them. And with women, they tend to feel, feel the little bit that I know of them, they tend to feel a little bit um, neglected. Uh, and they will tell so many stories about how a man and a woman will walk even to a, a, vet, a federal building and they will automatically think it's the man who is the veteran and the woman is inv invisible. So and that has caused them to really kind of stay in their own bubble. So I would love to be able to connect with them. What are some of the steps you already are planning to do in the next month or so to reach that audience? When with the Veterans Connect at the library, one of the ladies who was volunteering to collect the data that we submit on a monthly basis, we mean in the libraries that are, were a part of that with that um, funding, um, was is a veteran, a woman veteran, and they're up north, and she started a veteran, veteran women's alliance, and that has grown so much. Now I reach out to her. I, she would invite. She usually would have events up north and down here in Southern California and we would make ourselves available. We would set up a table and, and just introduce herself that Monrovia Library also is here to provide provide services and support to you women. So I'm working with her. Now she's going nationwide. As a matter of fact, I went on her website the other day and I saw that the other women veterans are organizing now too. So I'm, I'm reaching out to her. Her name is Melissa Williams, and, and she's been going since I I started working with her at Veterans Connect at the library. And now she's left the Veterans Connect, and she's doing her thing, mostly working with Women Alliance, but Veteran Women, Women Veterans Alliance. The and women vets that you're talking about, who among your group of volunteers is working right now to get them onto your local TV stations for a news interview? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that's the next step, of course. Anything my, else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, my experience was that it was very that there are that there are divisions between different veterans groups, and like yes. her experience of going to the VFW and finding no one younger there, because yes. uh, I've I've done programming where where um, I haven't known how to reach a younger group. Um, it seemed important. I was more successful if I had somebody who was like a cartoonist, uh, became a, uh, uh, I don't know whether it was for one of the, uh, he was a graphic artist from uh, the Afghanistan age group, you know, um, in Iraq and in Iraq. And I was able to get a younger audience for that. But it seems to me that the subject, uh, 
you know, the subject and the speaker matters in terms of drawing in uh, different age groups. Because, you know, I, I did a thing on, I had, did something around a book on Vietnam with uh, Mark Bowen, um, The Battle for Way. But the only people that came to that were, um, were Vietnam veterans, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of interesting. The topic you choose for the event is important in terms of what kind of audience you might expect to see or hope to see in terms of demographics, whether it's a younger generation or an older one. Um, I will say um, our paint and sip had a pretty good mix and we had some younger couples, younger veterans come. And also recently we partnered with the Monrovia Historical Museum and did like an early morning hours breakfast and private tour. And we had a lot of families, veterans bring their families to that. And then this summer we're working with our VSO, who is a young veteran himself. Um, he had the idea of partnering with our local uh, movie theater and maybe having kind of a family movie day for veterans and their families. So mm -hmm. like those kind of things, trying to get some of the veterans with their families out, the younger veterans, the female veterans, um, just anything we can to, to make sure that all veterans feel supported, that it's not just we're only supporting one group, like we're trying to support the entire population of veterans. So. Yeah. Harry, what you just said creates a possibility of doing a very quick lightning exercise off the top of your heads. Think about, you just mentioned going to movie theaters and a couple of the other groups. Between the three of you, given a minute or two to do this, just off the top of your head, either in chat or audibly, name the groups or partners that you have in your community. And don't filter. Just think of anything that you've reached out to as an example of those watching this program or watching the archive version of what they might do themselves to reach out. So, what does your community of support look like here? Oh my gosh, we have so many. <laughs> Please, that's the point I want to make. That was I the punchline. I will get started line. and then Kurt and Mabel join, jump in if I miss anybody. But yes, our historical museum, our historical society, our local Starbucks, local dance instructors in the dance studio, local movie theater. Um, we've had uh, support from the VFW, the American Legion Auxiliary, um, obviously our council, our foundation, our friends, um, all of the regular groups you would think of. Who else? Well, I know we, we have a connection with, um, a female veteran who has been to many of our meetups. So, and that's a connect. We've already had conversations there about possibly doing a talk uh, about female veterans and the stigma around that. And she was willing to be a speaker. So that that's on my notes right here as a possible, um, veterans event for, for that um, that demographic. Mabel, can you think of anything else? Carry yeah, on. Uh, one of the things that you also need to know is this, this question from Harvard. Harvard, you need to know your community. We have um, a, a local, I, I don't want to call it a food pantry, but Foothill Unity here in Monrovia has um, uh, provide services to, to low income, like I said, they have food giveaways on a regular basis. They have events that um, comes up on a, if you go on their web on their website, you will find out when they have events, which I've attended a couple of times with with our volunteers. It, it's a food, it's a, a food pantry, more or less, let me say that. They hand out foods and then offer, offers other services, counseling service, caregiving services. So it depends on what your community looks like. And here in Monrovia also, we have, uh, we sponsor the homeless, homeless. Um, we have a handout every every season, like in the winter, they have the, the house, how housing for homeless people where they, they will have provide services. Um, I just started a, um, a connection with a, um, a homestead. It's a homestead, a caregiving. They, they reach out to me and said, we have several veterans here. Um, do you do like a, like a um, well check? And because some of the, some of the veterans, some of the, pay, the, the clients in, the, in those homestead cannot move. They are in the inpatient. And so do you have anybody who can, who can stop by? So I'm working with our VSO right now to see whether he can do like a like a, a wellness check to for the veterans. Some of them are on dialysis, and, and so it, de it depends on so many different things. I've attended um, the Quarters Club. I've attended the Rotary Club. 
whatever you have in your community, just reach out to them. I mean, I was able to reach, when we started, I went to the council meeting and just presented ourselves with the help of American Legion. American Legion also have a um, auxiliary that's just women. The men are the post and the auxiliary, the women. So I attend those meetings as well. I have a connection with them. I attend um, Veterans Day program, which we do have here on Veterans Day. And Memorial Day, we have at a local cemetery. And, and you just go there and be able to connect with people, just let them know you are here to support that vet veterans group of people. And believe me, they are ready to help. Let's circle back to something you said early on, Mabel. You were in touch with legislators and assuming I'm assuming they're legislative aides. Can you just as an example of the breadth of reach you have, name a few of the people and the positions they hold that you're in touch with on a regular basis? Let's talk about the elected officials or their aides at this point. Um, with um, the two congresswomen in our, in our district, Congresswoman Grace Napanatano and Judy Chu. And the, with Grace Napanatano, I work with Tracy Cooper Harris. And with um, Congresswoman Judy Chu, I either work with Lauren Green or Enrique Robles. Um, State Senator um, Anthony Pontatino, I worked with Christy Harris. I think she, I know her name is. And uh, assembly, assembly, our assembly is um, Holder. And I worked with, um, I forget his name. I think his last name is Garcia. And with um, LA County Supervisor, which we also um, split our time with our veteran service officer with, I work with um, Patricia. So I, I work with different with different individuals. Those of you watching this, notice how quickly she rolled off the top of her head the people that she knows and can pick up the phone to or run into in the supermarket or whatever mm -hmm. that make up her basic foundational group of people that know what she's doing and the importance of it. And she knows probably what is of interest to them, what they're likely to support and where the sticking points are going to be. This has not come overnight. This comes from working with those people on a long period of time and not doing it mechanically just to check off the names of people you know. This comes from believing that the relationships that you build on behalf of your community and with your community are the essential portion, the essential element of what we all try to do to make things better. So thank, thank you, all of you, for everything that you've contributed here. I had proposed at some point to do kind of some workshopping here to have people present their plan, but I think we've got more panelists at this point than members because people have had to drop off to go to other meetings. So let's just do a, an abbreviated version of that for anybody watching this uh, who might be asking themselves, well, how do I start with this? If you're putting together a work plan uh, sometime over the next few weeks to reach out to somebody on a specific issue, what are the steps you take to make your advocacy efforts successful? Anybody? An audience members, not just panelists here, contribute to that either audibly or put it in the chat and I'll read the chat comments as they come through. What's on your checklist of things to do to make your advocacy effort on behalf of your community group successful? Can I add, add to that? Please. Uh, so when I first started in this position, um, I had to um, basically identify everyone in uh, Ontario City's network uh, or the library's network for uh, our veterans resources. So I had to, I had to identify the local uh, American Legion, the VFW posts, um, any um, contacts we've made in the past through, you know, through documentation that James, the previous librarian, had left me. Um, and, you know, see if they were still around, if they were still serving, uh, you know, still providing their services, whatever they whatever they did, uh, you know, be it uh, restaurants or just a facility, outreach centers, whatever. And so I had to, you know, sort of identify all those. And so I've been able to, you know, uh, do my own, you know, introductions to these uh, individuals or organizations and kind of make that connection. And I found that was like, you know, the the most daunting and uh, beneficial step was just making introductions to, you know, the community. John, trick question for you. Is the list complete? Uh, no, the, the question, the, the list is uh, always being added onto. And so I, I find that every, 
maybe every other week I'm adding like a new list, a, a new name or organization or company or something like that. Um, just the other day I discovered we had our own uh, embroidery company here uh, in Ontario, Action Embroidery. Some of you probably are familiar with them, but they do uh, military patches and insignias. And so I didn't know they uh, were here in Ontario, actually just like down the street. Um, so, you know, I added them to my list to see if I could reach out to them for, you know, um, if they wanted a partner for future, you know, programs or services and things like that. So, but yeah, what that's, you and I are, are yeah. making collaboratively <laughs> together here is if you're the kind of person that wants to do something, get it done and move on to the next thing, advocacy is going to drive you nuts because it's never done. But if you are a lifelong learner and somebody who is in it for the long haul, there is so much to explore and there's so much joy because you're always meeting new people and you're always seeing the impact of your work. I say this every time we talk about advocacy, I think one of the most important elements of it is to occasionally step back, take a breath and say, look what we just did. And every one of those words matters. Look what we just did. I grew up as a, a budding journalist working on news stories. And I learned very early on, as soon as a story was submitted for publication in the college newspaper I was working on, I no longer cared. I was on to the next one. What's next? What am I covering tomorrow? And advocacy is kind of like that, but we have to fight the urge to not stop and breathe and celebrate the steps we take that make a difference and make us happy. I All love right. that story about the, uh, I love that story about the patch company, because this is what you always, what always happens to you when you start reaching out you think you've covered everybody and then there's a great local resource you never even knew was there you know it's such a delightful surprise <laughs> and that's the joy of it thanks hubert that really yeah. captures it question my standard question toward the end of a session like this to make sure that we haven't just had a fun time and then we're all going to go back to what we were doing what's one thing you will do differently in the next week because you were part of this conversation primarily for the people that are in the session, the last three or four of you that are the people hanging on to the very end with us, but what will you do differently because you were part of this? What was the question again, the last, the last one? What will you do differently in the next week as a result of you having participated in this conversation? I'm gonna make more phone calls. Nice. For me, I will continue to help somebody like John or anybody in their community to, to support their veterans. They supported us when we needed them and they provided the freedom we're, uh, we're appreciating. I'm hoping we're appreciating now. And the more of us that are supporting them, the more appreciated they will feel. They've served us, we need to serve them. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out at this point, all of you watching the archive version, all five of you know, I hope there's at least a few hundred of you out there watching the archive version of this. This happens because we come together as a community and California Library Association clearly is a central point of meeting on that. So if you are a member of CLA and you're not really active, reach out to us, let us know where we can be part of your, your group. If you're not a member yet, look at it and say, Oh, if I remember, I could be part of this and actually making the change together. So think about membership. If you like what you see through the Ursula Meyer series, contribute a little bit to it to show that there's community support for this. Most importantly, because I know we are nowhere near reaching the size audience we could be reaching, share the, the links to the videos on YouTube. Let people know that we generally do this on the second Wednesday of each month. Start at 10 o'clock Pacific time. Sometimes these shows are as, as short as an hour, oftentimes or an hour and a half because we need that kind of time to cover it. And occasionally we'll do a two hour thing like our advoc advocacy basics workshop that we do once a year. So we're out there. We need to hear from you as to what we're doing right and what we could be doing better so that we all work together to make the kind of change we want to make. Panelists, any last minute thoughts before we say goodbye to everybody? No, I just want to add on that, that last question you were asking that kind of when I got here at Monrovia, it seemed like everything was already set and everything was great and everything was rolling. But that, that, that point that you mentioned is that it never stops. That kind of just really hit me right now that, yeah, I should probably go back to all the connections we have and reconnect because sometimes connections started to fade away and stuff like that. So I just want to, yeah, I'm going to re reconnect with a lot of groups and see if there's any new events or partnerships that we can do. 
Such a great reminder, Kurt. And Fiona's got a, a comment in there. I'm going to initiate a conversation with the local auxiliary legions women's group. They are at council every time and I've never spoken to them. Sounds like a good time to start. Okay, everybody, as soon as I give the signal, Karen will cut the recording. Those of you that want to stay for a few minutes to have unrecorded conversation are welcome to do so. I hope to see you next month, second Wednesday of the month, when we will have students and representatives from San Jose State University talking about what students are doing in advocacy and what we can learn from them. So with that, thanks for being part of this. Hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thanks to everybody at Monrovia. And Thank you so much. Bye.